just an overview on becoming a good judge. So hopefully you have the judge's instructions um, sheet, which might be updated from the one I'm holding here, depending how old this video is now that you're seeing. And on the back, the Danius guidelines for the actual number of points. So first, let me take a step back and just kind of give you an overview of what it means to be a judge. The most important thing about being a judge is remembering there's only four debaters in a room. Why am I saying that? Because I can't think you count? No, I know you know how to count. But the most important thing, and a mistake sometimes novice judges make, is they unconsciously think of themselves as the fifth debater in the room. And they count down an argument because, oh, they think, I might have done that better. Or here's what I would have done as a rebuttal. And that can't be relevant. Maybe you know what's wrong with an argument. It's still up to the other side to be the one that refutes it. So yes, there have been times when I've said, for the purpose of this debate, we're not sure Mars has gravity. I'm a physics teacher, I know Mars has gravity. Or for the purpose of this debate, we're gonna say girls are not good at math. Even though personally I've got a college degree in math, I know girls can do math. <laughs> but the other team didn't refute it. It doesn't matter what I would have done as a debater. I'm the judge. As a judge, I don't work for my team, I don't work for people in the room, I work for the tab room. I keep the, the tournament running. So, what does that mean? So in terms of the, of the debate, it means I keep track of things on the debate. So here, for example, I'm going to show you, these are some of my notes I take during a round. So during a round, I have my piece of paper. Some people use two pieces of paper. But I do take notes differently as a judge than as a debater. So here's the five speeches. And I'm keeping track of the debate. When they define things at the very beginning, you have to come up with your own abbreviations for things. So I put three little lines for when it's a definition. If it's something obvious, like US federal government's defined as a government of the US, I might not even write it down. If they define the US federal government as just the legislative branch, I need to make note of that. So I will. And then in terms of contentions, I notice the tagline for each one I write down, and then the various support. Well, at least what I'm, what I'm able to catch since I'm writing while they're talking. My own little abbreviation is I use round symbols for the AF team, just so I can keep track of them later, and I use triangles for the NAG team, so I can track them later. So later on, if contention one ends up attacking contention two, I can just mark that easily. Now notice the other thing that's happening, I put the NAG argument lower down than the AF argument. Um, some, some people, again, they use different pages, that's so I can follow the flow of an argument. I'm a real, I take a lot of notes during a, 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 a round. I'm also known as a flow judge. I'm keeping track of lots of things. Some judges just write down taglines. That's why it's your, when you're a debater, it's so important to make those taglines clear. Some judges just sit there and listen and take no notes at all. Do not underestimate those judges. Just because they're not taking notes like Dr. Day, they still might be lawyers with minds like steel traps. <laughs> and they, you don't realize that they're listening to every little detail. But if you're a beginning judge, I recommend keeping track of notes. Because part of what your job is, is to keep track of what arguments are said on each thing. So I will follow, if this person is second in one, then this would be a member of the opposition, here's their answer to contention one. So I followed that through. I might make myself a few notes, maybe it was good, maybe star, maybe weak. And then when they rebuild contention one, it's here. And then when they re-attack contention one, it's here. If somebody fails to re-attack contention one, then it shows up on my sheet as a blank. And I keep track of the fact that an argument was dropped. The people in the room often lose track of that, but I, as a judge, have to know that something went un unanswered. A dropped argument, depending on how important it becomes a debate, is a conceded argument. It's, so I do keep track of what arguments are dropped. A dropped argument is essentially a conceded argument. Now, how important that is in the round is something that I, as a judge, also have to think about. The other thing I do is, as long as I'm keeping track of things here, and again, I come up with lots of abbreviations, J is short for justice, um, WMD, short for weapons of mass destruction, I think having less important than doing this. The other thing is, especially as I get into these things here, I'm also beginning to keep track of what arguments are working or not. Just because, again, the, in, in some ways it's up the other team to point out an argument's weak, but also if an argument's weak, that's going to be part of how I judge. It's not to me to refute it, but it's up to me to know it's, it's a, sometimes on the, on the battle, right, this is a vulnerable argument. And I'll start keeping track of it. Now maybe if I'm slow on time, I won't just put F and A, I'll say, okay, um, this, they, they refuted contention one, it's really working for them, the next side is really winning this argument. Oh, this was pretty weak, the positive team, the AF team is still winning on that argument. I'll start keeping track of which team is beginning to win on this point about um, 
how old professors get, which team is being to win on how bad it is that Bangladesh is getting polluted. Mm. They're arguing back and forth which team is being to pull ahead in the persuasiveness of their argument. Because by the time the round is over, I almost need to know who wins right at the end. Close rounds, sometimes I can't quite tell. So that's all going on in my notes. Then after the round is over, then of course my next mission as a judge is to fill out the ballot. I thought, there you go. So that's space, don't worry. So the key things on the ballot, of course, I've already written in the resolution. You have filled out already the, gov the codes and the names. Do take a moment to make sure you have the team codes correct and the names of which person is correct. It's amazing how fast a small mistake there on one ballot can make an entire tournament, like a series of dominoes, the entire tournament tabulation falls apart. Um, and then in terms of points, now please note points, often called speaker points, are points for the speaker. They're not points just about their speaking quality. Some people think those points are only about delivery and then they try to get low points win. Because someone had great delivery, but man, their arguments were worth wet paper. Um, no, those are points for the speaker, how well they have evidence, analysis, refutation, etc. Um, and it should be, in terms of points, Danius has a nice scale. Basically, we're going to find most often points are in the 80s, in novice round often in 70s. There really isn't much reason for points below 70. Everyone's got something good they're doing. And frankly, if you put points over 95, you better be ready to explain it to me, because that means someone's not just best in the country. That's almost best in the world. I can go an entire year without giving points in the 90s. 80 to 84 is probably the more average in terms of points. Is there a different average for novice and advanced round, people sometimes ask? I suppose there could be. I find I don't tend to do that. Maybe I'm not smart enough to have different averages for two different um, schemes. The other thing I've noticed is there's a lot of overlap with quality between who's in advanced and who's in the novice um, bracket. Sometimes just, you know, schools do what we have to do. Is, oh, you, have to come out, you have to make your numbers of advanced novice work out in perfect sets of four, which doesn't work. So, you're like, so you put someone in advance to, oh, I feel so sorry for them that they're there. Or people that you think are amazing. Well, maybe that actually is their first genius tournament. And they're amazing. So someone who might be just great is a novice bracket. So maybe that's what the other reason I don't separate them. Um, but in terms of points, do kind of be thoughtful. We want to be mostly in, in sync with each other, we judges. So someone's points shouldn't depend on which judge the computer happened to assign them. There can be ties in speaker points. There should the two things there should not be ties for. There cannot be ties for rank in room. Rank in room is just one, two, three, four. Who is the top speaker in the room? Second place, third place, fourth place. There cannot be ties there. In, in terms of total points for the teams, the winning team should get more points. Maybe sometimes in policy we have low point wins, but frankly, it, in my philosophy, this is my personal philosophy, if a team won, they won because they did something better. Better reputation, better evidence, something was better about it. And they should, somehow that should, should work out on points, because points do cover those things, not just delivery. Comments. Comments are very important. And you'll notice there's not much room for comments compared to all the things I was writing down here. There's a lot of things here that we'll never see light of day. For comments, you have to pick out, and I begin to do this, you pick another one up, already. So here I've circled this. That's something that's so important to me, I know it's going gonna, it's gonna to appear on the ballot. I might circle something here. This is turning into an important point. This is turning into an important point. Huh! Blank space. That might need to get mentioned. That's something I dropped there. So you look at the comments that are important. What things are important for the debate? Think about what this person would need to be told in terms of, well, a couple things. First of all, what did they do well? Everyone did something right. I always think of comments as an SBS, sweet, bittersweet. Tell them something they did well. There's probably something they need to improve on. There may be something else they did well. Okay, maybe it was just eye contact, but there's always something they did well. Um, the other thing is they need to know why they won or why they lost. They really want to know why they lost. They know why they won, because they're wonderful. The team that lost really wants to know. Was it that they failed to answer that economics argument? Was it because in the end, that argument that girls are good at math or bad at math just in the end was not a persuasive argument it is a pretty vulnerable one, I've got to tell you. So you then do have to do judging of which arguments were good or bad based on what happened in that debate. Again, you're being this objective person. You check your own opinions at the door. You do mark which team won, and you put a reason for decision. Make this specific. Don't make it they debated better. Of course they debated better. That's redundant. Was it because they refuted better? They had better evidence. They had a more complete argument. They didn't forget that point about the dogs. I don't know what that point was. 
some brief comment on why was it in the end they won. The team that lost really wants to know that. Um, in terms of filling out the ballot, you want a certain efficiency in filling out the ballot. If you can't get it done when your second round people turn up, you can finish it during prep time for the next round. But that, that's only 10 minutes. So if you think you've got more than 10 minutes of work, then make your round wait. Holding up a ballot holds up the entire tournament. You want to get that ballot in. Again, that means every comment you think up might not make it on the ballot. Prioritize what needs to be said, the good and the bad. One last comment is some people ask about oral comments. I try to keep any oral comments as brief as possible. When I did judge training at my old district, we used to say any oral comment longer than five minutes is about the judge's ego. It's no longer about the students. That really got those shorter. Um, the other reason you should keep oral comments very, very brief is kids tend to put a big spotlight on those. And you give them a negative comment or what you don't even perceive as a negative comment that they do during round one, and now they're all nervous and not going to be able to succeed in round two. Especially if it's content, content specific, they don't need you lecturing them about Supreme Court justices before round two, which is going to be on Major League Baseball for all I know. So if there's only things that you think are going to be relevant during that day, they're swaying, maybe you can tell them that. They didn't face the judge. They should be told that. Oral comments should be very, very brief. Try not to make them very negative. If you think something's very negative, put it on the ballot instead. It's just, it's just safer. Remember, you're setting them off in the second round. So only keep comments, things that would be useful in the other rounds that day. It's OK to have zero oral comments and just smile at them and say, I'll put it all on the ballot and send them out of the room. All righty? Any other questions? Find a more experienced judge and ask. Never hesitate to ask. Thank you very much.